All right. Um, okay, without further ado, um, I'm going to start. So welcome everyone. Uh, thanks for attending the Tech Talk today um, that, that me and Julia is gonna present. So um, thanks, thanks Origin for hosting this, um, giving us this opportunity to present our capstone project. Really excited about it. My name is Gui, and joining me here is Julius. Um, Hello, everyone. Unfortunately, Link Johnson isn't able to uh, present today, um, but that's okay. Uh, let's get on to it. let's get onto it. So, what is spacecraft? Spacecraft is it's our capstone project, which is an open source real time collab with REPL, and. It basically, we allow users to write and execute code in Ruby, JavaScript, or Python directly in the browser. Our project is built with Node.js and uh, using WebSockets. It's also deployed with Docker. And we're going to details on why we choose um, to use WebSockets and Docker in the following slides. Now, the main goal here of our project is that we want to encourage a uh, pair program with uh, little or no setup required. So uh, here comes the most exciting part. Um, so right now I'm gonna give you guys a demo to show what we've built, what features we have. Um, so I'll guide you through so that um, before I go into the technical details later. So um, let's clear this up real quick. So as you can see, we have two instances of our uh, of, of our application open up in two different browsers. So now I have Ruby open up as a Maripal terminal here, and also there's a text editor at the bottom. Now, if you notice that if I type something in here, you notice that it syncs across other clients as well. Now I can evaluate code. using parentheses here. I can evaluate code in the REPL terminal and it works as expected. And I also want to show you a different language. I, I can also type directly into the text editor. As you can see, it syncs across other clients as well. And if I run this, um, you notice that it's being uh, piped into the REPL, and then I can call that function in the REPL. Now, our REPL also supports a color output, so if I type a number or a string, um, if, if, the, if the language supports color output, we also have that. I'm gonna show you Python as well, um, just a real quick. And you can see if I uh, evaluate, if I execute an infinite loop, it terminates when it exceeds a certain number of outputs. So that's a, a basically our demo. Um, I hope that gives you kind of like a more um, better overview of what we have built here. Now let's get into the uh, technical details. So uh, right now um, in this space, there's two main existing solutions. One is REPL.IT, and the other one is CodePad. So REPL.IT is basically a um, integrated development environment that allows users to execute code and have multiple files, um, and also comes to the REPL terminal. Now, we're not, we, we're, we have the REPL terminal and the uh, text editor, but we don't necessarily have a full de development environment. So we're not building what REPL it is building. Now, what I want to point out here is that REPL.it recently also launched a collaboration feature. And so it validates our use case um, as a very strong uh, project. Next, we have CoderPad. 
Now, CodePad is actually an interview platform that has a REPL terminal and a text editor, just like what you've seen just now. However, if you haven't noticed, um, CodePad and REPL.it, they're both closed source, and CodePad actually requires a paid account for unlimited access. So our goal here is to build an open source alternative so that developers can spin up their own service or um, improve upon it. Now our high level goals is uh, basically we want to enable a terminal -like interface as you've seen earlier for code evaluation in Ruby, JavaScript, and Python. We also want to allow multiple users to collaborate in the same REPL and also synchronize displays in real time. Now it comes to a few challenges. Uh, the main ones here are uh, we want to allow multiple sessions with each session having multiple users collaborating at the same time. So we need to figure out a way how to out isolate that uh, individual user session from one another. Secondly, since we're allowing users to enter code into our system, we want to prevent malicious code from getting into our host system and com compromising our, um, our, our entire server. Lastly, we want to achieve real-time code evaluation, ideally uh, very low latency and no noticeable lag. Now, with all these considerations in mind, we want to start considering what network architecture is the best to fit our use case. We count a few technical requirements to uh, help in making the, our decision. First of all, we want it to be scalable. So what this means is that, is that we want to be able to handle multiple runtimes. Um, now we're just starting with three languages, but in the future, we potentially want to add more languages, even compiled languages too. Next, we want to support three to five users per session. And then we want to detect if a client and when it disconnects so that when all clan disconnects uh, within an application, we want to basically shut it down and free up resources. Uh, lastly, we want to have a bi-directional communication. And why is this important is that since we have, we're gonna have high volume tra traffic from both clients and server, we want to be able to handle that. And also we want to be able to very easily stream data from the server to the client. Oh, we went for this client server architecture because uh, it fits our use case. And now with the client server architecture, I want to ask this question, where should we execute the code? Um, there is, we can execute the code on the client side or the server side. With each one, there's certain considerations that we have to, uh, that we have to think th through. Uh, the problem with executing code on the client side, which you explore a little bit, is that we basically have to run the entire uh, runtime in the browser. What this means is that we're gonna have the browser run Ruby or JavaScript or Python. And, and sometimes uh, it can potentially slow down or even hangs the browser. It's also not very scalable because um, we have, for each runtime, we're looking about around 50 megabytes of storage space. So that has to be downloaded onto the client side and that costs bandwidth and time as well. Lastly, not all languages come with the in browser compiler. What this means is that um, if we want to run Ruby in the browser, we have to use some framework or library like Opal that converts Ruby code into pure JavaScript that runs in the browser. Uh, but if you want to run Go or Crystal, we may not have that uh, option. In fact, Vincent Wu, which is the founder of CodePad, uh, he himself explained that one day he just sucked it up and realized that he couldn't do it uh, based on his initial approach of running in the browser. And and, and basically, in one of his interviews says that, what are you going to do, compile every program in runtime with like JavaScript? Well, good luck with that. So then now it leads us to the decision of executing code on the server side. And um, why is it so? Why is it so good to do it on the server side? 
it's because it allows us to very easily manage multiple runtimes. For example, if you want to install a, uh, additional language, it's very easy to do so. And it's more scalable because um, server storage, memory, and CPU are more readily available with, with the marginal cost than having to cram all that in the client side. Now, uh, it, it doesn't all come for free, however. First of all, we do effectively manage the server resources. So basically, um, we want to be able to say each application can only have uh, this much memory allowed and not um, consume the entire uh, resources in the host system. Also, there's an increased latency. And why is this so? It's because um, based on client server architecture, the client has to do a round trip for each request. So the client has to send code to our server and our server to send the result back. Um, and there's also a condition, consideration of hosting such service. It's, it's gonna be costly if we were to scale up to more users. But for the benefits mentioned, uh, it fits our use case and we decide that it makes sense. Now, um, for a network protocol, there's a consideration whether or not to use HTTP or WebSockets. Now, with, we have built both uh, prototypes using HTTP and WebSockets, and we found that WebSockets is the better choice. Um, the reason for this is that with WebSockets, once the initial HTTP handshake is completed, we have a full duplex persistent connection uh, which means that client or the server can initiate um, the sending of the data. With HTTP, however, the client has to, con um, for each request, the client has to wait for a response before sending another request. So um, this com will compound the overhead in terms of payload size. So it, it comes back down to uh, bandwidth again. With WebSockets, we can potentially have a lower uh, payload for each request. So for each uh, request, um, for each request sent, you only need to add about two to 10 bytes instead of around 200 bytes for HTTP. And since we, we are expecting a large number of connections between the client and the server, we want to be able to handle that. With WebSockets, we can uh, handle 1,024 uh, concurrent connections with a single server. However, HTTP, we can only handle six. That is due to the protocol limitations. And lastly, we want to be able to easily detect claim disconnection. And why is this important? Is so that we can know exactly when that we can shut down an application so that we can free up resources in our host system. Now with the network architecture getting out of the way, we want to build, we want to figure out how to build a REPL. Now the REPL here that I'm referring to is the backend uh, that evaluates the code. So as you can see in this diagram, it's, uh, it's a very basic interaction um, that you can expect from interacting with the REPL program. So just imagine, uh, just imagine pulling up uh, the terminal app in in your Mac or, or Linux, and then typing IRB in it. What it does is that it, it spins up a REPL program and, uh, and then the REPL program is connected with the terminal. So that terminal will handle all the operations with the REPL program. And then as a user, you will just enter a line of code to the terminal and the terminal handles that for you. And whatever that's uh, being evaluated will be outputted uh, to the user via the terminal. So um, this, is, this is what you experience in every day, right, in a local machine. However, in our project, we want to build something like this. So now we are, we are providing a service where user can enter code in the browser. And with this comes with a few challenges. Is that you notice that this question right there, which is that how do we connect our application server with the REPL program if we don't have a terminal? 
we came up with a few approaches um, and I'm gonna explain each approach and why it doesn't why it works or it doesn't work so the first approach is to very um, is to basically work with the languages wrapper module so for example in node you have a wrapper module that you can include in your application code and with that you can call methods to evaluate code and the methods there are methods that can output the evaluation result which uh, gives you a nice um, API to work with the wrapper program. There's a problem with this, however. If I were to want to run a Ruby runtime, then I'll have to write the application code in Ruby. Same for Python, same for other languages. So it's very difficult to integrate with other languages' wrapper modules. This leads to the scalability issue, is that we have to rewrite the entire application logic for each support language. And, and therefore, it's very complex to do so. So we don't want to go with this approach. We go with, uh, we explore the second approach now. So uh, to standardize this, uh, the way to handle inputs and outputs, we can spin up a wrapper program. And then we can basically have the application write to the standard input stream of the wrapper program. And when there's output available, we want to read from its standard output. Now, um, while all of these things are very easy to do, there's some problems associated with this approach. As you can see, uh, the input and output streams uh, may be blocked. And this will lead to uh, hanging outputs, which is not what we want, right? We want to be able to read uh, all of the outputs from the REPL program. Now, there's, uh, there's reasons uh, for why this occur. Um, sometimes it might be that um, the, the streams are not inherited properly and you have to close the input streams and that can cause like a bunch of issues as well. well and there's also another issue where uh, if the language is written in a lower level language, such as C, the read function actually says that it blocks the output until a new input is being written. So I won't go into too much detail on how that happens. Um, we have that in our case study, feel free to reference it. But what I wanna say is that it's not very scalable because although there are techniques to unblock those streams and enables, enable us to read the full output, the techniques is different from each language. And therefore the complexity increases because we have to manage each language differently. Now our final approach, which is pseudo terminals. So pseudo terminals solve the pseudo terminals solve the problem of the missing piece between our application server and the REPL program. So this diagram from earlier, as you can see, um, there's a missing piece, right? With pseudo terminals, however, it basically solves um, the, the communication between the application server and the wrapper program. So for those of you who are new and not sure what the pseudo terminal is, a pseudo terminal is a program that basically translates and process the inputs and outputs to our wrapper program. And so it provides communication channel between our application and the underlying process. Now, why is this important? This is important because a REPL program is a terminal-oriented program. That means that uh, it expects itself to be connected to a terminal. Now, um, with this, we have to persuade the REPL program such that the input is coming from a terminal so that it behaves uh, properly. With the zero terminal, uh, we can make sure that inputs and outputs are handled correctly and there's, there's no miscommunication. Now, if you're wondering, um, are zero terminals like that rare? Actually not. Um, you use it every day in your terminal app. There's actually a zero terminal on the back end that connects to the shell process that you are running. Uh, there's also a secure shell that is, uh, since it allows users to enter code remotely to be executed in the server, um, the secure shell needs a zero terminal so that it can communicate with uh, 
processes uh, on the host system, on the remote host. The advantage of using the SU terminal is that we can basically just offload all of managing inputs and output streams of different runtimes, and so it reduces our code complexity. Secondly, it standardizes the way how REPLs are connected and therefore increases extensibility. And uh, we can very easily add more languages in the future. Third, uh, we're able to send control sequences, such as control C, to the REPL program to interrupt. With that, we don't have to manipulate the REPL program directly, which is a lot more tricky. Lastly, we can capture full, full outputs from the REPL program, including colors and also the prompts. Now, with all these advantages, there's a trade-off of slightly increased overhead due to additional layer of processing. Now, this is not really an issue because, um, because even with this, we don't notice any difference in performance. So with all the benefits mentioned, um, this approach fits our use case, and therefore, we choose to employ this approach. Now, with our REPL built, we want to figure out a way to synchronize uh, inputs and outputs. I'm going to give you an example how collaboration works with output synchronization. So uh, the interaction looks something like this, right? Uh, the client first requests a line of code to the app server, and then the app server talks to the serial terminal and say, hey, evaluate this line of code. The serial terminal says, okay, here's your result. And our app server takes this line of output and broadcasts to other clients. Now other clients can will receive that output and then display it on the UI. For input synchronization, it works uh, very much like output synchronization. However, we need to also track the state of the current line so that we can more efficiently sync it with other clients. To demonstrate this, um, we're gonna we're gonna show an example here where the user presses a key open square bracket. So as you can see, when the user presses a key, the state is updated. And then the client will send a message that has the line of square brackets to the app server. Now our application parses up the current prop from the cached output. And I'll explain why this is important in just a minute. With those two pieces of information in place, the app server can will send the line and the prompt to other clients. Now, the prompt is important because uh, in our front end, the terminal doesn't know where a line begins or ends. So we want to basically clear off the entire line of the terminal, rewrite the prompt before writing the uh, current, current line. So with that, all of the clients are in sync, and um, that's the sy input synchronization. So I'm going to hand over to uh, Julius to talk about collaboration and handling conflicts, and he also talk about containers and the rest of the presentation. All right, cool. So <clears throat> let's talk about handling conflicts with all this collaboration going on. Um, so um, as with uh, pretty much any other kind of um, product that allows multiple users to write into the same area, there's going to be times where uh, two or more users are going to try and write something in the same line. And we want to try and make sure that we uh, handle that and make sure there's still a good user experience. So let's go to the next slide. Uh, Oops. Sorry. Right. <laughs> no, you're good. Um, so we're going we to talk about how we're going to handle these conflicts with our shared editing. Um, as I said, conflicts can happen if multiple users type at the same time or if the server receives updates in a different order than they were sent. Um, if conflicts are left unresolved, then all of the clients who are trying to collaborate together are not gonna converge to the same state. They're not gonna have the same output or the same input. And like I said, that's just not what we want for our user experience. So we're gonna start with talking about uh, handling conflicts with the REPL terminal, and then we'll get to the, um, the editor portion in just a second. So 
When handling um, conflicts in the REPL terminal, we chose to rely on eventual consistency, also known as the last write wins. And so I'll sh we'll show this in a little um, diagram in just a second, but basically if two or more users try and write something to the same line in the terminal, the last update that comes into the server is gonna be the one that actually gets chosen and broadcast out. The disadvantage with this is that there's less server overhead because we're not actually trying to um, manipulate the input and output, sorry, the input, and try and have it um, form a consensus. We're just gonna choose the last one. So there's a lot less overhead in managing that. And so our code is a lot com less complex for that. The, the disadvantage is that of course, one user may overwrite another user's input if they're the last write. However, for the REPL terminal, we decided this was an acceptable trade-off because there's only one line in the REPL that anyone can write to at any one point. And because that's usually where you're trying to store some state or you're trying to execute something to get your output, we are assuming that everyone collaborating is gonna be like a good user, a good agent, and communicate and say, hey, I'm gonna type this to the terminal. So that's why we chose it for this, um, for the terminal. And so you can see here that we have two clients who are collaborating and they're trying to write in the terminal at the same time. Uh, client one is saying, hey, I wanna write the character A, and client two is writing character B. Now, client one, their request is sent with a latency of 90 milliseconds, so it arrives to the app server first. Client two has their request with character B sent with 100 milliseconds. So this results with the character A coming in first and then the character B coming in second. And since the character B from client two was the last write, it wins. And we're just gonna overwrite and have B be the character that's broadcast out to all the clients. So now let's talk about um, handling conflicts with the text editor. And this one um, is more complicated because unlike the REPL, when you have multiple users in the text editor, it's a lot more reasonable to expect more people to be typing at the same time, just trying to handle different areas of the code, or maybe they both see, multiple users see something to change. So with this, we have this diagram to show what could happen with two different clients. So client, uh, they, both clients start with an initial state of AT. That's just a string in the text editor. And client one on the left says, okay, I want to put character C at index zero to make this string become cat. And that's what I want. And so they locally update it to cat. But client two, on the other hand, wants to say, no, I wanna delete the character at index zero, A. I wanna end up with T. And so locally, they will see T. But when both of these clients have their operations sent to the app server to be broadcast out, then the other client is gonna receive that operation and their state's gonna change into something that they didn't want. So client one is not gonna get cat, they're gonna get AT. Client two on the right is gonna get CT, which is not what they want. So. This is something that can reasonably happen in a text editor when you have multiple people writing to the same line. So to handle this kind of conflict, we chose to integrate with YJS, which is a shared editing framework that uses a conflict-free replicated data type or CRDT to resolve conflicts. Um, and basically it's just a way of when you have all these operations coming in that they converge to the same state. So in the previous description, both clients would have the same string at the end of the day. And the, the advantages, sorry, of this uh, using YJS is that concurrent edits converge to the same result, regardless of the order applied. So all of collaborating users are gonna have the same display. And this enables conflict-free real-time editing. Now the trade-off of this is we have increased memory usage on the server side and increased bandwidth at the end of the day because we're having this logic handle these conflicts for us. And to give a reason as to why we chose to integrate with YJS instead of building our own CRDT, uh, CRDTs are a complicated subject. And in fact, there's a whole capstone project dedicated to building one with a project called Conclave. So I would recommend if you wanna learn more to go check that project out but we wanted to focus on building 
the REPL as the core of our project. And so we offloaded this to YJS. So now let's get into our container architecture, which is personally one of my favorite parts of this project. So as you may remember from before in the beginning of, the pro of this uh, presentation, we said that we had some problems with running the app within the host environment. We've got some security issues and some resource sharing issues. Um, we said that since we have this direct connection to our backend, um, that users can submit code for evaluation, well, that's an open door for users to send malicious code into our system. An example of this is something called a dirty cow or copy on write, which is an exploit that gives attackers root access to the system. So it could be something that allows them to then be able to write or delete files, or once they take over a host system, they could start affecting other users. And that's not something we want to happen. And with resources, um, it's really hard in the project in its current state to limit resources for each user session. A one user may submit code that's really computationally intensive, could be something also like an infinite loop. And that execution suddenly causes a spike in memory or CPU usage, which then hogs that away from other users. So one session doing this kind of code could cause all the other ses sessions to dramatically decrease in performance and cause a bad experience. And that's not something we want either to happen. So we're gonna choose to use containers to handle these. Before I dive into how we do that, I wanna talk about what containers are because it's not something really talked about um, in the launch school curriculum. A container at the end of the day is an encapsulated single unit of software and it can contain an entire service. So you can think of it as just a box where you put in all your dependencies, your software that you want to run for a service or you wanna build a project and then it runs inside that box isolated from your host system. The, what this allows is that it allows you to have this area to work in and it prevents any conflicts with configurations on your host system. There's none of that issue of I'm trying to um, work on this project, it requires a certain version of software, so I have to deactivate another version on my computer. You can just hop into the container where everything's set up for you. Now containers are built from images and an image is just a file that's a snapshot of all the dependencies stored inside. And the next slide will show us more. So here we have our image at the top. And like I said, an image is just a file that lists everything that should be in a container. We have our operating system, our application source code. We have for our project, the language runtimes. So we have Ruby, Node.js and Python. And when we wanna create a container, the image just serves as a blueprint to create that container. And in each container, we have everything there for us and we can run our application. For those of you who are in the um, object-oriented programming course in the back end, I like to think of images as classes and the containers as objects that are instantiated from the class. That kind of helps me have an idea of what's going on. And as you can see from the little logo in our image, um, we chose to use Docker as um, our solution for creating containers. Um, it's pretty widely used and it has pretty great documentation. So it's easy for us to get started with it. And so now we can talk about why are we using containers? Well, containers allow us to have some isolation between application instances or sessions. So we can have in each container an entire instance of our project with all the runtimes, all the dependencies, and our users can just work in, on the app in that container. Within containers, the file systems are self-contained. So users don't have access to the file system on the host, the server, by default. Um, containers also have a lower footprint in memory. A container can be just megabytes in size, whereas a virtual machine, which was really what was widely used um, before containers came to be adopted, virtual machines can take up gigabytes of memory. And so since we wanna scale out to allow many sessions on our server, um, having containers be smaller in memory was really helpful. Additionally, we can add security measures to our containers to make them stronger in isolation and to handle our security issues. And we can also easily limit the memory and CPU usage for 
each instance, each container with C groups. And C groups are just short for control groups. And so when you create a container, you can say, I want this container to use up no more than 100 megabytes of memory and at most 20% of CPU from my server. And so then, no matter what is happening in that container, no matter what code is being sent by the user, whether it's an infinite loop or something intensive uh, with computation, it's not going to hog resources away from all the other sessions. So you can go to the next slide. And here we have um, a diagram showing what we're talking about. We've got a remote host and it has three containers. Each has our entire application inside of it. And each one has multiple clients connected to it. And you can see that in the middle, we have one container that's been compromised in the sense that a client has tried to submit some malicious code to it. Well, with the container, this instance of the app that's been compromised is isolated and all the other users in their own containers are kept separate and safe. And also with those C groups, no matter what's going on inside that container, it's not gonna steal resources and all the other containers can then run without any performance drop. Now, there are still some issues from security risks with containers because containers by default are not entirely secure. It's what we add onto them to make them more secure. And from uh, the get-go, applications that run in containers can access system resources on the host system. And this is because containers speak directly to the host system. One of the reasons that containers are smaller than virtual machines is because when a container has to do some kind of um, access system resources, it can just speak to the host system. The problem with this though, is that a particularly crafty or persistent attacker can use that to escape from the container and get into our host system. So you can see here that we have our container with our app inside of it, and it can make system calls to the host kernel, the host operating system inside our server that's running all our containers. And there's very little or actually very weak isolation between the container and the kernel. And we wanna try and target that isolation and strengthen it. So one of the, the first step to do that is that we secure containers with non-root access. We want to create a new unprivileged user profile and run it as non-root when initializing containers. What this means is that whenever a client connects to our container, they run as an unprivileged user. So then they're limited in the actions that they can perform in the container. So with our project, when a client connects to a container and they um, try to input any kind of Linux commands, touch, or they wanna remove a file, they actually can't, they can't execute those commands. Any user can type rm-rf home directory all day long and it's not gonna affect our system at all. And the next slide, um, we have then the second step, which is that we're gonna secure our containers with a container runtime sandbox. And what the sandbox does, it gives us, is it gives us a stronger isolation against the host kernel. It basically is intercepting all those system calls that I talked about before. Um, using rule-based execution. And at the end of the day, all that really means is that it's acting as a guest kernel with unprivileged access. So any kind of call that the container makes has to run through the sandbox and it protects our host system. There is a trade-off with using a sandbox because we have to use a sandbox for every single container. And the sandbox is just giving, um, causing a higher memory consumption. And the result of that is that if we run um, a sandbox with every container, we can only run 50 containers with a four gigabyte RAM server. But if we didn't have a sandbox at all, we weren't running them, we could double that to 100 containers on the same um, four gigabyte RAM server. So there is a trade-off, but we think it's worth it for the security. And so here's that updated diagram. We have our container with our app we have our container sandbox runtime sitting between it and the host kernel, and it's there intercepting all those calls. And for our implementation of the runtime, the like sandbox runtime, we chose GVisor, which is an open source solution from Google. All right, and now we get to the last big component of the project, which is 
now that we've built our project, we have the REPL, we have our containers, how exactly are we gonna connect users to a container? And the naive approach is to use port forwarding, which is basically where we forward a request from one host and port number to another. So this leads to a direct mapping of a container's IP address and port number to an internal host. So we're basically taking a user and mapping them to a specific container for their session. And here you can see more detail what this means. We have three sessions. Um, we have spacecraft-repl.com and is port 5000. The second one has port 5001. The third one has port 5002. And each of them is mapped to a container which has its own IP address and port. And you can see each IP is just a little bit different. Now, this is not actually a good design because these ports are predetermined. You can see that it's 5000, 5001, 5002, and so on, which means that anyone could really access any session at any time if they probe for open ports with a port scanner, or literally if they just find out, hey, I'm on port 5000, let me just change, let me try 5001, and then they can hop into that other session that they weren't invited to. And this is just really a complete lack of privacy. We don't want one user to disrupt a session they weren't invited to. So we had to address this and we chose to solve it with a reverse proxy. And the way we did this was that we set up a web server to act as a reverse proxy. And what the reverse proxy does is it sits between the clients and the server as an intermediary. And its job is to abstract away the connecting of these IP addresses and ports. And what it does is that it assigns a random session ID every time a user requests a new session. So these session IDs are not only random, they're a lot uh, more complex than just the simple port numbers, which makes it very hard for someone to guess, um, guess a session ID. So this ensures a privacy of our user sessions. Additionally, Reverse proxy is a bonus to us because as we scale our project and add more servers on the back end, the proxy can serve as a load balancer. So it can take a lot of user requests and evenly distribute them amongst all the servers. So not one server is getting too overloaded. It can also cache content if we need to. And here is that updated table now where we have those three sessions, but now we have this random session ID in front of it. And as you can see, it's a lot harder to guess each of those to get into a, um, a different session. And here's basically the cycle of how this works. So verse proxy is gonna sit there and regulate all the client traffic and it's gonna route HTTP sessions to a container. So the client is gonna send a request saying, I wanna to connect to a session of spacecraft. And the verse proxy is gonna catch that and then it's gonna relay the request to the server. The server is then gonna say, okay, here is a container's IP address and port number, connect them. And the reverse proxy is then going to take that client and forward them over to that container. So now they're connected, but they don't exactly know the exact uh, IP address and port from the get-go, and um, they have that session ID as well to ensure privacy. And now, once that initial HTTP handshake is complete, and the client is set up with their container, they're then connected through WebSockets, and they can then have that bi-directional communication with either all the input being sent um, to the app or output being sent to all the clients. And the bonus with the WebSockets connection is then when the last user in a session disconnects, we can then tear down that container so we can free up some resources for other sessions. And it's really important that we tear down these containers when clients disconnect because there could be some state they stored in the REPL session that we don't want for the next user. And we really just want to give a clean slate to new users. All right, and we're going to finish up with just some future work, some plans that we have to extend our project. First, we'd really like to add some remote cursors for user identification while writing text editor, something kind of like how um, Google Docs has like the anonymous hippo or something, just like something colorful with a text that can help you easily see which uh, of your collaborators are where in the text editor. We also want to um, allow users to download code from the editor and save it on their computer. 
and then upload code um, to a session of spacecraft later. So maybe they don't want to lose the code they wrote or they wrote something in their free time, but they didn't download anything to run it locally. They're just going to put it up on spacecraft. We also want to add support for more languages, especially really exciting ones like Rust, Go, Crystal, and Haskell. And for several of these, we need to figure out a way of handling compiled languages, which will be different from how we've been handling the current languages we support. And finally, we want to implement a request queue so that we can handle an even larger number of requests very graciously when they're made at the same time. And that's the presentation. Thank you so much, y'all, for coming out and listening to us. You can see our project's code on the GitHub here. Um, we have a website, but we still need to put the finishing touches on it. We'll let you know when that's done in Slack. And we're free to take any questions right now if you have any. Yeah, if you, uh, you can actually open up a Q&A uh, window in Zoom and you can type in the questions there or I think, okay, no questions so far. Yeah. So, so yeah, uh, feel free to post any do questions. Have, do you have this hosted online? Um, <clears throat> yes, we do, we do have it hosted online. We have the, um, a server um, from uh, DigitalOcean running it. Um, we were just doing some maintenance on it a little earlier today, which is why we chose to run it on local host um, for the demo. But we do have it hosted online and we should have it up soon. Yeah, um, you can go try out repl.space. Um, so I'm, uh, I think it's up and running. If it's not, let us know so that we can spin it up and make sure that's uh, up and running. So what is the cost for hosting and stuff? So um, we use DigitalOcean for like the basic, the one gigabyte RAM, the very basic low end server, which works fine. It's, it's about $5 a month. And then uh, if you were to add more RAM, CPU and all that, with a four gigabyte RAM, two CPUs, uh, can go up to like $20 and, and so forth. So it depends on uh, you know, how, how many users, how many sessions want to run in, in, in the host system. So it depends on, yeah, it depends on your need. Okay. <laughs> Refl.it, yeah, Refl.it is great. Um, but now we have open source one. So, um, so, so, uh, so someone asks, I was curious if you want to get this out there and running, how does that work from a resource perspective? Um, I just have no clue if you had a hundred users on it. Is that practical? So we did some tests um, in the four gigabyte uh, host system and we, f we figure out that, uh, as mentioned before, without GVisor, you can run like a hundred containers in it. And even with GVisor, we can run 50 containers. And with uh, each container having two users, we can have 100 users, potentially. So um, the, the bottleneck here is more about the number of sessions, one session per container. Um, since we can have 5, 10 users per container, but the memory consumption will increase by a lot for that. So, so far with what we've seen, it seems pretty practical. but if we suddenly get like, I don't know, a thousand users tomorrow right. or something, then we're probably going to have to <laughs> have to increase our, our droplet or buy a few more droplets. But um, yeah, we'll just have to wait and see. Does yeah, containers still plan to, sorry. No, go ahead, Gary. Um, we still plan to have a Heroku alternative that people can deploy on their own. That's, um, I'm, uh, that that should be pretty easy to to deploy, and once we get that set up, um, everyone can just spin up their own in in their own Heroku. Gotcha. So um, Jason asks, does container size depend on the number of sessions currently active? Um, it doesn't really. So the container size is pretty much they start off pretty much the same. Um, I believe when we started building the project, each container was around like 40 megabytes in size. And then we got it kind of 
down to something a little less, but that's just the default size that each container is going to start off as. And it's going to naturally grow as users store state and do all kinds of things in it. Um, so the size isn't going to change. Um, but you know, if we have so many sessions that we run out of space, then there's just no more containers until we upgrade to a bigger server or something. Okay. Oh, whoops. Oh, <laughs> so I was saying, I was seeing like three JSON over Bs uh, in the in the participants list. Okay, um, any further questions? Um, if not, I mean, if you have questions after this, uh, feel free to email us. Uh, if not, Okay, oh, we got more questions. Cool. Okay, go. You want to take the next one? Yeah. So, uh, so Kramer asks, uh, switching to Q and A here. Okay, how do you know how to solve the problems? For instance, how do you know to use uh, TGS, YJS, or, or GVisor, or even about pseudo terminals in general? Uh, the answer is that um, we don't at first. It it takes a lot of research and comparing and contrasting different approaches. Um, so for, for YGS, um, for YGS, it's a little bit more straightforward because um, YGS is the only framework that's out there that's really good, that's integrated with uh, WebSockets as well. Um, we also consider use, you know, implementing a CRDT, but we feel that it's too much work, so we just want to offload that to something easier. And YGS provided us that solution. Uh, for GVisor, it's um, uh, it's not GVisor or not, but it's about uh, effectively securing a container. Uh, based on research, we want to uh, make a container sandbox so that users aren't able to access the host system resources. So, um, and we came across an uh, open source project by Google, GVisor, and they have a wonderful uh, they have a wonderful write up. And so we decided that it's a uh, it's good for our use case. Pseudo terminal, yeah. we we had to go through a few approaches, as we mentioned in the presentation. We we start with uh, interacting the shell. We spend like almost a whole week. It doesn't work. So <laughs> then we think about you know pseudo terminals, and then figure out that okay, it's potentially a workable solution. So let's just stick with that. Yeah, I, th I think one thing is also like, we didn't instantaneously like figure these out or like even some of these took way longer than just a couple of days. Like we, uh, we found YJS pretty soon with just some Googling and GVisor as well. But pseudo terminals, that was a long process. And that was just like a lot of research, a lot of Googling, a lot of stack overflow, like just digging, digging. And actually that's yeah. one of the things about these capstone projects is that the coding actually wasn't that hard it was actually just so much research and troubleshooting and finding out what to try out so it's just how much time you want to give to researching it um, yeah just like containers we didn't know containers exist or what they are until we we want to uh, effectively secure our application then we found yeah. out that this thing that's called container so yeah. Right. And then like with the reverse proxy, like we were like, oh, how are we going to solve this port issue? And then we found out about reverse proxies and we'd never really ever heard about them before. And we're like, well, I guess we're learning them. Right. So, so um, yeah. Next question. Um, Jason asks, how long does it take to provision a new container? Do you mean like instantiate a new container? I believe that's what you're asking, right? Not just correct me. Uh, it, takes, it, it takes about one or two seconds to uh, instantiate a container. However, it takes an additional three, three to five seconds to, um, to spin up the, the node server. So when the container is started, it doesn't immediately uh, have our node.js server running. It actually runs node server.js command, and then we have to wait a few seconds for that to get ready before the user is able to connect to our session. Yeah. Um... 
And like, you know, when it comes to that kind of problem, that's when we have to figure out other ways to kind of speed up the process. And one thing that we didn't include in the presentation, because it was kind of nitty gritty, was we had a, we figured out a, well, we researched a way to basically have um, the, like the, the web page sent, uh, all the assets sent uh, more quickly. Um, with just like minifying assets and zipping them and everything. And that just kind of helped out because, you know, we already have this latency of spinning the container up and then starting the server. Let's minimize what we can. And that was like delivering assets. So if you can't optimize one thing, just gotta find something else to optimize. Um, next question on the other side in the chat is from Jesse. Uh, how, do you f how did you figure out the right size problem to go after? Something that wasn't too overwhelming or too simple. Uh, that's a good question. And it's actually kind of like something we had to really like, it's kind of like experience based because when we started brainstorming projects for capstone, a lot of the time, like our team was like, we don't think this project has enough. Like when we first started thinking about this whole spacecraft project, we were like, we don't know if this actually has enough to, to chew, off of, to chew and to like talk about. But the funny thing with a lot of these projects is when you dig into them, there's just so much that you don't know that you don't know, like that it suddenly surprised you. Like we knew nothing about containers or Docker or reverse proxies. And so we had to learn about that. And it, this project just kind of ballooned um, from that. Um, and we actually went from this project doesn't have enough to, oh my goodness, this project has too much. We got to figure out what to cut back. Um, so it's just a process. And over time you just, as you do a project, you just kind of realize, uh, you know, how much you really want to keep. So I guess like sometimes it's like figuring out the right size problem. And then other times it's like taking your problem and reducing it or expanding it. Just find something you want to make bigger or something. Well, I hope that was a good answer. Um, <laughs> Kramer will definitely know everyone when it's up and running. Don't worry. <laughs> yeah. You can try a wrap without space. Uh, you can also go to our, GitHub page, uh, we have instructions on how to install that in your local machine. Um, so yeah, try that out. Let, let, let us know if there's any issues with that. Uh, we'll keep you guys updated. Okay, so, problem. right. Um, so Kramer asked, what open source license did you use? So um, we still need to get that. So we're gonna, we're, going, we're gonna have the MIT license, I believe is what we, we were looking at. Um, but yeah, um, there's a couple of them to choose from. Um, but really, we don't see to make this like a commercial product or anything. So we'll probably go with something pretty f loose like MIT so others can download it and then modify it f as they want. Also, MIT license is like pretty much the standard across most of GitHub right. open source. I, f I feel like we're going to get less questions now because you sent the, you sent the REPL.space. <laughs> everyone's gonna... yeah, everyone's trying, to, trying to spin up containers right now. Yeah. Okay, so if there's no further questions, um, we'll wrap this up. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thank, thank you, uh, Surgeon, for hosting. And, yeah. and thank you, everyone, for attending. Yeah, thank, thank you so much. You. And, uh, and if there's anything you, know, you found like, you it was confusing or something, um, please feel free uh, to like direct message me on Slack. Um, just so like, I'd love to hear what you thought and if there's anything we can improve on. Okay. That uh, concludes our presentation and uh, hope you guys have a good night. Yeah, good night. Thanks for coming on Friday.